is yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak Romanian, so I didn't understand what Mihai said. I hope he said nice things about me. <laughs> Talking about me also. So thank you, Mihai. Uh, and I want to thank you all for coming to this beautiful location that we have today. I've been doing this for a long time, uh, probably about 17 years I've been working in the balance worker field. And in that time, I've had a chance to present. Uh, I remember once I spoke at an old log cabin in, in Western Canada. I once spoke at a restored mansion that belonged to the DuPont family in the Northeastern United States. And of course, countless uh, conference rooms. But I think this is the most beautiful ballroom I've ever spoken in. So, so thanks for arranging this. And, uh, so even if you don't like what I say today, at least we're in a nice place. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, but I think you're going to like what I have to talk about today. We're going to talk a lot about balance scorecard. But before I do that, I want to tell you a story that will really kind of set up what I'm going to speak about today. And it's a story about sculpture, specifically the great French sculptor Rodin. And one of Rodin's most famous works is, um, it's actually a sculpture of another Frenchman, the novelist uh, Henri de Balzac. And when Rodin created this sculpture, of course, he worked on it for a very, very long time. You know, it was a painstaking work that, uh, that took him a you know, long time to complete. Finally, when he completed the statue to his satisfaction, apparently it was 4 o'clock in the morning. But he was so excited that he had completed this beautiful work of art that he had to share it with, uh, with some people. So he went and he woke up one of his students, you know, and again it was 4 a.m., the student was groggy, but he brought the student to his uh, studio to see the work of art. And <clears throat> of course the student said, oh, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. But the more he looked at it, the more he focused on the hands. He said, these, these hands, they, they're a work of art. If you do nothing else in your entire career, these hands will render you a genius. And Rodin thought about that for a second, but he wasn't really pealed. And so he said, okay, thank you. And then he actually went back into the village and he summoned another one of his students, and he brought that student to look at the, the statue as well. And that student also, after staring for quite some time, said, these hands are alive. You know, it's, it's wonderful what you've done with these hands. And Balzac, or, uh, pardon me, Rodin was a little bit uh, upset at this point, so he said, okay, well, I'm going to get one more student, and he went back, and he woke up a third student. Sure enough, this young man came and said the same thing. He said, these hands are alive. They're a wonderful work of art. You're a great master. And Rodin was so upset by this that he went to the corner of his studio. He grabbed an axe, and he ran at the statue. And the students had to, to grab them and subdue them because they were worried he was going to destroy this beautiful work of art. And he shoved them away, and with one swipe of his axe, he chopped off the hands of that statue. And so today, if you see the statue of Honoré de Balzac, you'll notice that the, the hands are, are missing. They're long, he's wearing a long robe with sleeves, but you won't see the hands. The reason is that what Rodin told the students, and what is so important for all of us today, is that no part is more important than the whole. That's why he was so upset. He said that we can never just emphasize the hands. This whole piece of art has to, sit, has to exist on its own. Yeah, no part is more part and important than the whole. And really, that's my message with you today. That with the balance scorecard, no part is more important than the whole. So we're going to talk about what a balance scorecard is, why it's so important, and why emphasizing that whole of your organization, whether it's a public sector or nonprofit or a private sector organization, is so important. A uh, brief introduction to me, uh, and again, I'm not sure how much Mihai shared with you, but I, before I became a writer and a consultant and a researcher in balance worker, I was a practitioner, like you. And uh, I work for, I'm a Canadian, I'm Canadian originally, I live in the United States now, but I'm a Canadian citizen. And I worked for a company in Canada that was a very, very early adopter of balance worker. We were one of the, the first probably five that implemented balance worker. And the reason we chose to implement a balanced scorecard was because historically we had been very good at developing strategies. So we had lots of binders up on our shelves with our strategic plans, but we were very poor at executing. We never achieved the results that we anticipated from our plans. And of course the promise with the balanced scorecard, even from day one, was executing strategy. 
So we became an early adopter, and uh, it's a very long story because at that point there were no books or session seminars like this. We had to learn everything ourselves. But we were ultimately very successful with the balanced scorecard. We improved our financial returns, our customer satisfaction and loyalty scores improved. All of our internal process at the company showed uh, improvement. But the big aha moment for me, and the reason I, that I'm standing here in front of you today, is that we had done su surveys with our employee base before and after we developed the balance scorecard. And we asked them, how much of our strategy do you understand, and how, how, do, you, how do you fit in with it? You know, are you able to contribute to our strategy? And we had very, very low numbers on that metric for balance scorecard. And we were convinced that that's what was holding us back in our execution. Uh, after we developed our balance scorecard and cascaded it throughout the organization, and I'll share with you what that means, uh, we saw those numbers skyrocket. Suddenly, through the development of performance measures at every level of the organization and the communication strategy, people were understanding how to execute and all of our numbers fell into place. And so when I saw that work at our company, which by the way was a public sector monopoly, it was a utility company, I realized that this can work anywhere. And so I've dedicated my professional life uh, to helping other organizations uh, learn more about the balance scorecard and apply it. And you can see some of the places I've worked over the years. I've worked for large consulting firms. I started my own firm in 2001, the Sunless Group. And I work with all, the, all sectors. I don't know how many of you here today are in the public sector or nonprofit sector, but you'll see that this tool is one that can apply to all. And uh, you know, I've written several books on the topic, and you can see them there as well. So what I'm going to talk about, we're, we've got um, two uh, components uh, this morning. In section one, before we have a break, I'm going to talk to you about the fundamentals of the balance work right system. I don't know how many of you are really familiar with the system, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the tool, uh, why it was developed, how it was developed, and, and uh, by whom. And I'll talk about um, some basics of the model and how you, how you use it. And I'll close this component with, uh, with benefits of using the balance work right system. After our break, I'm going to come back and I'm going to speak with you uh, for a period of time on how you can successfully execute the balance scorecard. So first component, we'll talk about what it is and how you can benefit from it, and then we'll talk about how you can successfully implement it. So uh, some statistics to start off our journey today, and you can see them on the, on the page behind me here. But uh, just very quickly, 80% of respondents reported making changes to the performance management system in the last three years, and about 33% <coughs> describe the change as a major overhaul. So at any given time, a lot of organizations are changing the way they measure and manage performance. Now, my second bullet there talks about the fact that more than 60% of Fortune 1000 companies are using the balance work rate system. That number is actually higher now. And Hackett, uh, an HR consulting firm, did a study of 2,000 global companies and found that 96% were using the balance work or planned to use it. So the first question we'll start with in our, our talk today is, is why? Why are so many organizations changing the way they measure and manage performance and why are they going to the balance scorecard? I think it's primarily because the balance scorecard helps us overcome three challenges, whether we're aware of them or not, that are really uh, having a, taking a toll on all of our organizations. And they are the rise of intangible assets, our historical reliance on financial measures of performance, and perhaps most importantly, the difficulty of executing strategy. So let's just scratch the surface a little deeper on those. The picture behind me here is Peter Drucker. He's a very well-known management guru, so I'm considering the, the father of management thinking around the world. And there's a quote here from, from Drucker that I took from The Economist magazine where he said that knowledge workers now account for a full third of the American workforce and outnumbering factory workers two to one. In another 20 years, they're likely to make up two-fifths of the workforce of all rich countries. And, you know, uh, you can't open up a business magazine or uh, talk radio or anything when it comes to business without people talking about intangible assets. We talk about the importance of human capital and, and, and intangibles and relying on the value of our people and knowledge. But historically, in business, we have not been very good at, first of all, identifying the intangible assets we need to drive forward on our strategy, measuring those to the best, to best effect to make sure that we're using them accordingly and appropriately, and, and again, moving the strategy forward, and uh, executing them and modifying them for the long term. And so, as you'll see very shortly, 
one of the biggest benefits of balanced scorecard is that it forces us to identify the intangible assets we need to succeed. And these intangible assets, whether it's, it's knowledge or it's uh, information or it's the culture of your organization, are critical to success. Have a quick look at the graph on the screen behind me there. It demonstrates the rising value of intangible assets in organizations over the last 20 years or so. And we can see that back in 1982, only about 38% of value created by an organ typical organization was intangible in nature. 10 years later, it's 62% today, at least 75% of all value is created by intangibles. Now what does that mean? It means the, the value that you create from your organization by making creative decisions, by working with other people in your organization to manipulate data into information to make better decisions, by utilizing the culture of your organization to, again, help you execute your strategy. So this is a really vital area of balanced scorecard, identifying those intangible assets and measuring them to make sure that we're, uh, in fact, executing your strategy. A second reason the balanced scorecard has become so prominent is because despite the fact that intangible assets are so important to our success, we tend still in organizations to rely on financial measures of performance. You know, I bet if I went around the room and asked you to tell me about what you measure in your organization, we'd probably see a majority of the measures being financial. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because historically the measurement of business has been financial. Bookkeeping records used to facilitate financial transactions can literally be taken traced back thousands of years. And at the turn of the 20th century, it was financial innovations, like the return on investment formula and others that we still use today, that were critical to the success of the early industrial giants. So today, you know, well, well over 100 years later, over 60% of all measures in business today used for decision making and resource allocation and performance management are still financial in nature. Am I talking too loud? Uh, no, a little too fast. A little too fast, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if I'm talking too fast, I apologize for that. Uh, so I'll, slow, I'll slow down a little bit, I promise. Uh, the measures are still financial in nature. And the reason is that that's a problem is that uh, financial measures, as you can see in the slide behind me here, are, do not match the business realities of today. You know, I just mentioned the fact that about 75% of all value is created by intangibles, but of course, financial measures don't really track that intangible value for us. I think the biggest criticism of uh, financial measures will be represented by my second bullet. They're like driving by a rear view mirror. If you drove over to the hotel today in your car, chances are at several uh, points you look in your rear view mirror to see what's behind you, and that's exactly what you're doing. You're seeing what's behind you, but not ahead of you. And in business today, I think all of us need indicators of what's going on in the future, what's going to happen next. And so we need non-financial indicators that will help us do that. Yeah, there was a, a book that was written several years ago called Built to Last. I don't know if anybody read that book. It was written by two gentlemen named Collins and Boris. Collins went on to write to, uh, Good to Great, which is, the, I think, the best-selling business book of all time. In fact, if each of you in the room buy about 100,000 copies of my books, we'll, we can catch up with Jim Collins, so stock up at lunch, please. But in the book, Built to Last, Collins and Porus looked at 18 companies that outperformed the stock market in the United States 40 straight years, from 1950 through 1990. And recently, some authors went back and said, how many of those companies outperformed the stock market between 1990 and 2000? And only six of the 18 had it. So, even if you've got decades of financial success, that's not indicative of future financial success. And so we need measures, again, that are going to lead us to the future and tell us, if we're going to be successful financially in the future, what are the indicators that will get us there? And lastly, in this slide, you might notice there's a picture of a computer in the, in the top left corner. That, believe it or not, is a, is a computer. It was called the Alto. And it was developed by Xerox way back in 1976 before IBM or Apple had developed their first computers. But the reason we're not all typing away today on Altos is that the management team at Xerox that time, of course, was very financially motivated, like most companies are, they're a good company. And when they saw this computer, they said, you know, no one will ever buy that. There's probably no market for it. We need to make our quarterly numbers so they didn't move forward with the, the product. And, you know, Xerox is a great company, but that was a major strategic error if they could have had that first mover advantage on the computer, but they didn't because they were focused on financial numbers. So I have to keep that in mind. 
course, I always mention to people uh, that uh, that was a little pricey. I think back in 1976, that cost over $30,000. So amazing considering what you get for the computer today. Probably the most important reason the balance scorecard has become so prominent and is such an important tool for any organization is that it helps us overcome this difficulty of executing strategy. And it is difficult. Yeah. The earliest research that Kaplan and Norton, who developed the balance scorecard, did, and the reason they developed the scorecard, was that they discovered that only about 10% organizations effectively execute their strategies. So about 9 out of 10 fail to do so. And so the first thing that they did and other researchers did was try to dig into this statistic and find out you know, why do so many organizations struggle when it comes to executing strategy. And they found four barriers that they highlighted that they thought were really, really holding organizations back from came to executing. And I've got them on the slide here behind me walk through them very briefly, and I would ask that you think about your own organization and your own experiences to see if this ring true, rings true for you. The first barrier is the vision barrier, and it suggests that only about 5% of the typical workforce understands the strategy, which was the case of my company in Canada. Everybody was busy, everybody had roles and responsibilities and, and, and functions, but they didn't know how their work was fitting into the long-term strategy and that impeded their ability to make effective decisions. Because when presented with a choice, they didn't know which was the more strategic alternative. And so an enormous barrier for organizations is the fact that the vast majority of people just don't understand the strategy. So why is that? Yeah, I'm sure we all have any thoughts about that. One of the main reasons is that we don't effectively communicate our strategy. I think for the company that I work for in Canada, the, our executive team will get together and we'll, put, we'll build the strategy and we would never take it any further. We'd never really communicate it. So we couldn't really expect our people to execute it when we didn't communicate it. It's one of the major flaws or difficulties. A second barrier is what we describe as the, the people barrier, suggesting only 25% of managers have incentives linked to strategy. So incentive compensation systems, bonus systems, are very popular. Most private sector organizations in, uh, in the United States, it's about 80%, have some kind of bonus plan. But in the vast majority of cases, they are linked to short-term financial targets, not long-term strategic growth areas like innovation or customer, uh, customer loyalty. They're linked to financial targets. And so that causes managers to make decisions that improve short-term financial results, but neglect long-term strategy. So that's a big challenge as well. The third barrier, and I think perhaps the most interesting, something I'm going to talk about a little bit more after break, is the management barrier. And it suggests that 85% of management teams spend less than an hour a month discussing strategy. So think about that because I know we all spend a lot of time in meetings. And so think about your leadership team meetings. You know, what are you talking about? If you're talking about strategy, you're probably in the minority. You know, I, I sit in a lot of client meetings and I'm always surprised at how operational and tactical they are. And that's important, there's no, no doubt. But as leaders, we need to be thinking about the strategic decisions. You know, the, the customers we're serving, the markets that we want to, to dominate, to, uh, the uh, products we're going to offer, our value proposition. That's what we need to be talking about. So if we're not discussing strategy, we're not executing. <laughs> Lastly, we have the resource barrier. It suggests that about 60% of organizations don't link budgets to strategy. And I know we've all here probably got a lot of experience developing budgets. And typically, you know, when we develop a budget, we take what we had last year, we add a little here, subtract a little there. But what we really need to do to be effective is link our budgets to our strategy process. And the balance worker allows us to do that through what we call strategic initiatives, which I'll talk about a little bit more about later. So I hope you've had a chance to think about your own organization, and I hope you can see that. With these four barriers, it makes the execution of strategy extremely difficult for organizations. And based on what I've talked about, we can see that I think a change is needed in the way that we measure and manage performance in organizations. We've got that rise of intangible assets, so we know how important it is to have the right people with the right skills. We know that we've got to go beyond financial measures of performance. And lastly, we understand that we, we have this difficulty of executing strategy that we have to overcome. Well, the balance scorecard is a tool that helps us overcome all of those challenges and uh, 
improve our performance in many additional ways. It, uh, it was developed, for those of you who are new, and I know uh, Mihai has a history in these uh, brochures packets, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but two gentlemen named Kaplan and Norton, and we can trace the balance work record all the way back to 1990, so more than 20 years ago. And historically, actually, we could go back further, further than that with other, uh, or other systems that were similar to balance work record. But they were primarily trying to solve a measurement issue. How do we overcome this almost exclusive reliance on financial measures of performance? So they brought together uh, a group of companies and did a study. And they challenged these companies to develop new and different performance measures beyond financial that they thought would help stimulate their growth and, uh, and their profitability going forward. And in, de in developing these new measures, they asked them some basic questions. You know, why are you in business? And these were all for-profit companies. So they all said, well, we need to have, have a good return for our shareholders and be profitable. And so you can see at the top of the diagram, we have something called the financial perspective performance. So the, what we're suggesting there is that if you're a private sector company or a for-profit company, the first thing you want to do is, is measure your financial returns. So we're saying, if we effectively execute our strategy, this is what we expect will happen. Next in the study group, Kaplan and Norton asked their, these uh, participants, how will you derive your financial success? And they all said, of course, that we have to sell you know, products and services to targeted customers. And so Kaplan and Norton simply challenged them to measure their performance from their customer's point of view or their customer's perspective. And so you can see our second box, if you will, our second perspective here is labeled customer. Thirdly, they, they said to them, you know, if you're going to achieve financial results and, and satisfy your customers, how do you do that? And all of the, the, the groups in this study said that we, there are certain internal processes that we have to excel at. And so the third perspective of performance of balance work is, is called just that, internal processes. So what do we need to do well internally to drive results for our customers and to achieve value as an organization. Lastly, but certainly not least, on the bottom of my diagram here, I have something called the employee learning and growth perspective. And the idea there was that Capital and Norton and the study companies realized they couldn't achieve financial success or drive value for customers without people. People who had the right skills, we talked about that a little bit previously, people with the right information, and people operating in an environment that was conducive to growth and change. And so they labeled this fourth perspective employee when they grow. That was the basic model of the balance worker as it was constructed some 20 years ago today. And for the most part, it remains. We'll, we'll talk about differences in a, in a little while. But primarily, those, uh, that, those are the fundamentals that remain today. Uh, what you'll notice about the diagram here, what's new or different about this model, is that we see the word strategy at the center. And so unlike a lot of performance measurement systems that start with the budget, the balance scorecard starts with your strategy. So it forces you to take that strategic plan document and bring it alive, make it dynamic, by translating it into measures in each of these four perspectives of performance. You'll also notice in the diagram behind me that we see arrows connecting the four perspectives. And what we're ideally attempting to do with the balance scorecard is tell the story of our strategy. So if we possibly can, we want to link these measures together to tell a story. For example, if we give our employees adequate training, that they'll be able to produce a better quality products that our customers will buy, and that, that will drive our revenue. That's a very simplified story, but that's what we're attempting to do. Mold these measures together to tell a story. So if you're in the public sector, Everything I've said still applies, but the model I've got behind me now looks just slightly different. There are a couple of minor differences. First of all, you'll see the word mission at the top. For most public sector and nonprofit organizations, uh, of course, while you want to be good stewards of your funds, you're ultimately here to serve a, you know, a higher mission. And so we have a mission box at the top. You'll also see that the customer perspective is elevated. So that again, yeah, why you get, why you want to be effective and efficient in your use of funds, ultimately at the end of the day, everything you want to do is directed towards improving the lives of your, your customers, your stakeholders. And so we see that box is elevated. But otherwise, the model remains the same. Public sector organizations have internal processes at which they must excel. They have people and technology that they have to employ to drive their strategy. 
And of course, if they have customers, very demanding customers that they have to satisfy. So the model applies equally. Let me share with you now, very briefly, some, uh, some additional insights on what most organizations measure in each of these four perspectives. And we'll start with financial. And as I say in my slide here behind me, what we're attempting to do here is really um, tell our strategic story and think, you know, if, if at the end we're very successful at executing our strategy. So when I talk about strategy, I mean the priorities that you're going to employ, you know, the, the markets you're going to serve, the customers, the products you'll offer. If we successfully execute that strategy, what does it mean financially? So are we expecting double-digit growth, for example? Do we expect enhanced profitability? Do we expect a better return on our assets that we employ? So you have to challenge yourself when you're developing a balanced work record by saying, if we successfully execute, what do we expect to happen financially? And measure yourself. Hold yourself accountable for that. I think it's also really important to here to measure your performance relative to your competition. Michael Porter, who's a very well-known guru, a strategy guru from, from Harvard, always talks about the fact that competitive advantage is a relative thing. So in business, what we're trying to do is create superior value relative to our competition. He talks about all industries having pools of profit. And what you want to do as an organization is grab the biggest share of the profit in, in your pool. And so I think it's important in this perspective to also measure your performance relative to your competition. So that if you want to, if you're measuring uh, revenue growth, for example, and you achieve 20% revenue growth, that might be great until you find out that your competitors are registering 30%. So relative performance is very important in our financial perspective. In the customer perspective, I would challenge those of you uh, who have a balance worker, those who don't, to answer three questions. First of all, who are our customers? That's maybe the most strategic question that we can ask ourselves, what markets are we going after? What do they expect or demand from us as an organization? And lastly, perhaps uh, the most interesting, what is our value proposition in serving them? In other words, why would anybody buy from us? You must answer those three questions and develop measures for each of those three questions to populate this perspective of performance. And I want to spend just a moment on that third question. How do we propose to add value to our customers? This is a chart that's a, I know the print is small here, but uh, I'll walk you through it. It's a chart based on a book that was written uh, several years ago. And the authors talked about the fact that organizations have to make a choice and have to present themselves to the market. And they have basically three choices. Some organizations, if you look at the left hand side of my diagram, choose to offer the most innovative product. So what they're saying is that uh, you know, we're going to give you a product that is technologically superior, full of functionality, uh, we could probably pay a little bit more for this, but again, it's at the cutting edge. That's how we compete. And of course, they, they, that would then, uh, mean that they have sort of measures that indicate they're being very innovative. A great example of an innovative company uh, is, is Apple. Of course, with the iPad and the iPod, that's, that's their value proposition. And like so many of us, I've read, I've read many quotes uh, from Steve Jobs uh, since he's passed away, especially. Uh, there seem to be more and more coming about him all the time. But apparently, a reporter once asked Jobs uh, why Apple had not produced a netbook. And you might recall netbooks that are small, um, inexpensive computers that most of the people use for email and, and the internet usually two or three hundred dollars. Uh, and Steve Jobs replied that we will produce a netbook where we can create something for under five hundred dollars that's not a piece of junk. And so you know, his thinking was that you know, with Apple, everything they do has got to be the best. It's got to look good, it's got to perform really well, it's got to be you know, superior in every way. And he didn't think he could do that at the price point it would take to be competitive in the netbook market. That's being disciplined to a value proposition. And it's so important for all of us to think about that. You know, what, what is our value proposition? And how do we measure our ability to deliver it? Other organizations, if you look at the center of my chart, try to offer the best solution to their customers. And so they tend to compete on, on sales and service and creating long-term relationships. So with this sort of organization, 
they're not looking at a one-time uh, sale or transaction. They're looking at creating value over the long term. And I'm sure this is the case in Romania and elsewhere in Europe, but in the United States, we have a, a store chain called Nordstrom, and they're legendary for their customer service. If they have good products, they try to offer competitive prices, but how they distinguish themselves as an organization is through service. You know, anticipating their customers' needs, uh, trying to find them with a wide array of choices, and helping them navigate through those choices to make a selection that they're happy with. And that's their value proposition. And of course, they measure based on that. The third box on my chart here is uh, what we call operational excellence, or offering the best total cost. And so organizations that pursue this value proposition are really trying to keep the cost down for their customers. And typically they employ some sort of formula. You know, fast food restaurants are a great example. If I, if I went to a McDonald's here in Bucharest, it would be very similar to you know, a McDonald's in San Diego where I live. It's all about a formula for keeping costs down. And so while they're, of course, you know, concerned with their, their menu offerings and what they provide, and they, uh, they want to provide a certain level of service. At the end of the day, what they focus on is keeping the cost down and being operational and excellent. So very important for all of you, if you're developing a balanced scorecard, if you have one now, I think a critical test is, are we pursuing a value proposition? Now, some of you might look at this and say, well, in today's very competitive circumstances, we have to be a little bit of all three. And, and I agree with that. You know, all organizations have to uh, be very nimble today, provide great service, innovate, and provide a competitive cost. But at the end of the day, you have to make a choice. Which of these is the most important to you? Again, think of Steve Jobs. No netbook, they can't do something under $500 that isn't great. So this is really critical to developing measures in that financial perspective, customer perspective. What is our value proposition? The third perspective of performance is internal processes. And here we're, we're uh, really uh, marking a, a change in our balance scorecard from what, so what do we want to achieve for our financial stakeholders and our customers, to how, how are we going to do it? So all organizations have processes. You know, my little company, I have many. I write, I market, I publish, I communicate with clients, I develop new products. The challenge for you in developing your balanced work art is to isolate the most important processes that drive value for customers given your value proposition. So think about this for a second. You know, again, if, uh, if I'm Apple, for example, and I'm really focused on developing great breakthrough products, well, my internal process perspective, I might look at a lot, and I might have a lot of measures to in research and development, maybe joint ventures, maybe number of patents held. But what I'm focusing on internally is what I think will help me excel in driving value for my chosen customers and my value proposition. Uh, for a company like, uh, like Walmart, for example, or, or any company that tries to keep their costs down, like McDonald's, it's going to be different. It's going to be about the supply chain and logistics and working with suppliers to keep their costs down. So I would challenge you to go back and look at your operations, and again, if you have a balance for a card, say, are we really isolating the most important processes to drive value for our customers? That's the essence of this, this perspective. Lastly, we have the employee learning and growth perspective. And this, I think, perhaps is, is the most important perspective, even though, as I mentioned here, it's often overlooked. Because what we want to do here is isolate those intangible assets <coughs> I talked about earlier that really provide value and help us execute our strategy. So again, let's think of, uh, of our friends at, at Apple who want to be really innovative and create breakthrough products. Well, they need people with a certain skill set to help them do that. So they're hiring you know, a certain type of engineer and certain people who can help them market. They've got to determine you know, what skills, competencies do we need from our people to drive our strategy forward. So it's really important here for you to think about the people that you have on your teams and how their skills match up with your strategy. A second area of what I call capital here is, is information capital. 
We all rely extensively on technology to drive our organizations forward. Well, I would challenge you when we go back to organizations tomorrow to say, are we employing our technology in the pursuit of executing our strategy? So are, are we using technology that will help us make better strategic decisions? Really important. And lastly, I've got a big box behind me here that says organizational capital. So I would challenge you just to think about how, um, how you share knowledge around the organization, how you employ teamwork, just generally how your culture affects the execution of your strategy. And what I mean by that, I'll give you an example. I had a client once not long ago who talked to me endlessly about the importance of, of teamwork. And they said, you know, Paul, if we're going to execute a strategy, we need all of our people working together. But the reward systems and their culture were all around individual performance. So their salespeople were, were highly compensated based on individual sales targets. Uh, the culture was all about winning with customers as, as individual salespeople. And so that culture was clearly inconsistent with their strategic direction. So think about your organization and your culture and how it impacts your strategy. One of the important things to take away from today, if you're new to the balance scorecard, is that it's more than one thing. It's really three things. It's a communication tool, because we talked about the importance of uh, overcoming that barrier of only 5% of people understanding the strategy. It's a measurement system, because we want to measure our ability to execute our strategy. And it's what we call a strategic management system, because we want to link it to things like our budget, and our performance appraisals to make sure that we put strategy at the center of everything we do. So I want to talk for a few minutes now about using the balance scorecard as a communication tool. And the way we do that is through something called strategy maps. And when you think of a map, of course, you know, uh, I used a lot of maps, my wife and I, this past weekend here in Bucharest. A map helps us get from point A to point B. I'm here at the Athenae Palace, I want to, uh, to get somewhere else. How do I do it? You know, what are the guideposts and landmarks that help me get from point A to point B? A strategy map is really just that. It's a, a document that helps us really uh, guide ourselves on how we're going to get from the development of our strategy to its execution. A definition that I use, if you like definitions, is that a strategy map is a one-page graphical representation of what we must do well to execute our strategy. So, let me walk, break that down just really briefly. One page, you know, most strategic plans obviously much more than one page long. But our strategy map should be one page. Graphical representation. Again, most of the strategic plans are you know, full of charts and graphs and long narratives. But with our map, we want to combine pictures with words to create a compelling image because this is primarily a communication tool. And lastly, the map is comprised of what we call objectives, which are what we need to do well to execute our strategy. When Calvin and Norton originally developed the balance scorecard, there were, there were no such thing as a strategy maps. Again, they were focused primarily on measures. Kaplan, one of the co-developers of Balance Worker, has said that the advent of strategy maps is every bit as important as the development of the Balance Worker itself because they're so powerful at communicating the strategy so that people can understand it and then act on it. I want to share with you a few examples of strategy maps and, and tell you how they've been effective for, uh, for some of the organizations that I've worked with. Of course, you've, uh, you know, on your CV that you've all received, you can look at these in much more detail, but this is the strategy map for a company in California where I live now called uh, Reg, and it's a sports medicine company. And like all of uh, all the other clients I've worked with over the years, they struggled with getting people to really understand where they were going as an organization. It's a, you know, they're a sports medicine company, so they're fairly uh, technical and then you know, they have a very specific market uh, niche that they serve, and they couldn't really get all their employees on the same page, if you will, on, on how they were going to work and, and attack that market. So they took their strategic plan, which was, was very thick, and they condensed it and they articulated these objectives on this strategy map. 
And you can see, I think, even without being able to read it really clearly, that it's a powerful communication tool. Uh, first of all, they don't call it a strategy map because they don't want to introduce more terminology to their teams. They call it the game plan. Because being an organization that works in sports, they, you know, that game plan is a more familiar term to them. And so they say, this, this is our game plan for success. And they've got pictures of some of the actual patients using some of their devices so that people can you know, readily see that, that, yeah, what we're doing really makes a difference. And then they've got each of the four perspectives that I talked about in, in, in some, some length. And they talk about what they need to do well in each of those four perspectives. And this map has been transformative for them because now they can have, they have meetings with all their teams. And rather than bringing out a, a big binder with a strategy, they put this up. And they talk about the implications of doing these things on the map very well. And what that will mean and how it will help them succeed as an organization. So it's really helped them get over that vision barrier of people understanding the strategy. This one is a little different. And you'll find that all strategy maps look different. And no two are alike because no two organizations are alike. This is from the Newark Public School District. Newark is a city in the north, northeast of the United States. And uh, what you'll notice what I want to focus on here is how they've changed the language to fit their culture. So on the left-hand column, you don't see what I talked about earlier. You don't see anything that says customer perspective or financial perspective or learning growth. You see our focus. That would be the same, to them, that would be their customer perspective, our focus. And, and if you read the, uh, the objective to the right, it's about preparing children for success in work and life and, and uh, molding young minds, if you will. They have their strategic priorities listed next their people, their information, and finally their resources. So one of the problems that they had was that uh, they really wanted people to buy into this idea of strategy and executing strategy, but the people uh, in the school district were not comfortable using business language. And all the approaches that they used in the past had focused on business terms. So they simply took this idea, which they loved, of a strategy map, and they changed the language to fit their culture. And now, it's, again, it's helping them execute their strategy very effectively. This is one of my favorite examples of, of a strategy map. It's from Brother Industries, and I'm sure you're all familiar with Brother, who make uh, label makers and typewriters and, and all sorts of fax machines, all sorts of things. I guess probably not typewriters anymore, I should, I should say that. Uh, but when I would originally worked with them, their first strategy map was more hierarchical, if you will. Had the financial perspective, the customer perspective, the internal processes, and then learning and growth. But their president, whenever he would get up and, and talk to all of his employees, would say that the customer is the most important person in our universe. You have to be focused on customer satisfaction. Yet the graphic behind him had financial on top, and so there was an obvious disconnect. So they liked all of their objectives. They liked their goals of comprising this, this document, but they just didn't like the way it was set up. So they went back to the drawing board, if you will, and, and redesigned it. And this is what they came up with, and I, I love this map. So it's more circular compared to the others that I've shown you so far. And the customer is on the top of that, even though they're a for-profit company. But you'll notice that the arrows connect the four perspectives. So they're, what, what they're doing now, and what they do in their meetings, is they start with the importance of the customer, talking about enhancing customer satisfaction, but they build that into a broader narrative of how they can only do that with the, with the right processes, with the right people, and employing their technology and their finances effectively. So it's really helped them tell their strategic story to their employees. And that's important for them because it, uh, as a manufacturing organization, they've got highly skilled, highly compensated engineers, and they've got people that work on the very front lines in a manufacturing facility. But everybody has to understand the strategy. And by using this document to communicate it, they've been able to do that. Uh, just a couple more examples here. This is a, a nonprofit organization, a client of mine. They're uh, called Valley of the Sun United Way. And I won't spend a lot of time here just other than to say it looks a little different, but uh, this is, what, uh, this is uh, effective for them and their culture. The last map I'll show you, this one looks a little bit more complicated. And what you'll notice here is if you can see it, right, there's an arrow to 
towards the top left that says strategic themes. Some organizations will build a map using what they call themes. So when I talked about those three value propositions, you know, having uh, the best product, or the best cost, or the best solution, sometimes they'll develop objectives for all three, and they want to link and group them together. And so they'll develop themes that run through each of the four perspectives for each of those uh, different value propositions. And this is, a good, if you're new to Balanced Square Card, and maybe your, your company is new to strategic planning, or you haven't got a very concrete plan, using strategic themes can help you really think about your strategy. So you can, if you want to crystallize your strategy and make it uh, stronger, you can use themes in a strategy map forward uh, format to help you do that. Balanced Square Card, of course, we talked about communication system. It's all, all this, uh, also about important to, to look at measures. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on measures, but I just want to tell you, I think the most important thing for you to think about when it comes to performance measures, and I know you're going to hear a lot about that from our speakers this afternoon, is keeping your measures simple. Uh, I've been doing this now for over 15 years, and I can say without a doubt that my clients that employ simple measures that everyone can understand tend to be more successful with it this than those who employ very technical and complex measures. And a couple of examples here from uh, the music field that illustrate that. This left-hand picture is uh, from the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. And they developed uh, a performance measurement system several years ago. They had a new conductor, and the conductor was challenged with artistic excellence. So you know, we, need the, uh, we need the orchestra to provide artistic excellence. Well, how do you measure that? Doesn't that sound kind of subjective? And so they talked about you know, all the things that they might measure. Ultimately, they set a lot of measures like this. The number of standing ovations they receive, the number of invitations to prestigious, prestigious festivals, uh, ticket sales outside of their home city of Cleveland, things like that. Very simple things that they can track. <coughs> and I saw their lead singer, his name is Chris Martin, being interviewed on a, a news program in the States called 60 Minutes. And he was talking about the fact that Coldplay is so popular now that he could, he said he could go out and just sing happy birthday for an hour and everybody would go crazy. So he said it's really hard to, to really kind of find out what songs people are truly responding to. You know, because again, they're so popular that people just go crazy no matter what they do. So he says his metric, his performance measure, is when he sings a new song, he looks for the, and they of course play in big stadiums, he looks at all the, the tunnels that lead up to the concession areas and the restrooms, and he says if he sees a lot of shadows in the tunnel, that means people are going off to, you know, to use the restroom or to get a drink, and he said obviously they're not, they're not responding to the song. But he says if he plays a new song and sees no shadows in the tunnel, that, that means people really like the song. Now, you know, think about what a simple metric that is with huge ramifications. You know, Coldplay has to decide when they perform new material what's going to go on their next CD. And Chris Martin's metric for that is shadows in the tunnel. So, you know, if that's good enough for Coldplay, it should, simple measure should be good enough for us as well. There's a, a quote here at the bottom of the page from Jim Collins that he says that, you know, one of the most important things organizations can do is just find a few simple measures that they can track uh, with rigor and talk about. And that's, again, something we'll talk about after break, how important it is to really discuss these results. Everybody's using performance measurement now. This is a global phenomenon. Here's a small, small, small uh, idea of some organizations that, that use it around the globe. Here's some of my public and nonprofit clients that, that have used it primarily in North America. So what are the benefits? Let's, let's close out this part of our talk today with, with benefits that you can expect from Balance Worker. Probably the most important thing is, is represented by that first bullet, that focus on strategy. Remember that only about 10% of organizations historically really effectively execute their strategy, and primarily that's because most employees don't understand it. If you can develop a, a really robust strategy map that tells your story in a compelling way and communicates it, that's a huge hurdle that you've crossed. So people can now say, oh, I understand where we're going. And then if you can supplement that with a, a, a group of simple performance measures that you can track over time and share with people, you can, you can then start moving towards the execution of your strategy because you're measuring it. You're saying to yourself, this is where we want to go. 
this is how we're going to get there through our strategy map. And here's how to hold ourselves accountable for results. So it's a really powerful tool for getting everybody focused on strategy. I think that's probably the greatest benefit that you'll get from it. Something else I'm going to talk about after break is the idea of generating alignment. You know, again, if we want to execute strategy, we need everybody's involvement in or across our whole organization. It can't just be the leadership team, it's got to be everyone. And we can generate alignment with the balance worker through a process called cascading, where we develop scorecards at lower levels of the organization that demonstrate how people contribute to the, the overall uh, success of the organization. <coughs> that is a tremendous benefit to executing strategy, getting everybody involved. And the balance program helps us, helps us do that as well. I won't work through all of these. I think some of them are, are you know, very self and very evident. But I'll spend just a second on that last bullet, create a culture of managing for outcomes. Again, after the break, I'm going to tell you the story of an organization, uh, t transportation uh, authority back in the United States. And like so many organizations, they had cultural issues. People showed up for work every day, but they just were not motivated. You know, they didn't really know where the organization was going. All they ever heard was bad news, you know, budget cuts, and uh, less and less people are riding our buses. And so the CEO of that organization used performance measurement through a balanced record system to transform the culture. You know, he said, the first thing we need to do here is just get people thinking differently. And we can do that through measurement. You know, he, said, he said, just from walking around and talking to people, he realized that they, just, they didn't know how the organization even worked. You know, they did their job, whether some people were mechanics on buses, other people were drivers, other people cleaned the facilities, but they didn't really know how the whole picture worked together. And they used performance measurement to really tell that complete story and change the culture. And they got tremendous results. Uh, in an era of uh, budget decreases, they actually had a fair cut. So they lowered the price to ride the buses in that, in that city because they were so successful in, in generating positive returns to the balance of our measures. So it can really help you transform the culture of your organization. I'm sure some of you are saying, yeah, well, what about the bottom line? And uh, a lot of studies have been done. This is based on work by David Norton, who is one of the co-founders of the Balance Scorecard. Results that he presented at a, a forum in Dubai not long ago, looking at three key financial metrics, market value of equity, equity, book to market, and net assets. And just looking at firms that employ the Balance Scorecard compared to firms that don't. And you know what were the uh, what were the effects of employing the balance scorecard over several several years? And he's got three year post adoption rates here, and you can see that there were tangible financial benefits associated with balance scorecard. And a lot of studies have been done just around the simple fact of measuring. You know, there's a, there's no many old sayings about measurement. You know, you get what you measure, and you can't manage something without measuring it. So just by a simple act of measurement. You have a tendency to improve results because you're isolating areas of performance that are important to you. So a lot of financial benefits as well. But I, I, I tend to focus on the intangible. Of course, I know even for my small company, I have to be focused on the financial. But, but look at this. Uh, I think this is a very interesting study from, from Harvard Business Review just a couple of years ago, or a few years ago, 2009. And you know, I'll read it for you if I, if I may. When the CEO makes it a priority to balance the concerns of customers, employees, and the community, employees perceive him or her as visionary and participatory. They report being willing to exert extra effort and results improve. I think that's, you know, just before we take our break here, that's a good thing to be thinking about. Because all of you here, I'm sure, are leaders in some capacity in your organization. And if you demonstrate this commitment to a balanced set of performance measures and balanced performance, it really changes the view of your employees. They see that you're looking beyond the bottom line to what impacts, of course, their lives, what, what's in it for me, how we have what we're doing to improve the lives of our customers, and how do we constantly make our processes better so that we're performing more effectively. So like, we'll come full circle in our short talk here, like Rodin, you know, if, you're, if you're using balance work or performance measures, you're exercising what, just like Rodin, that no part is more important than the whole, and you're demonstrating that to your employees. So I think it's really vital to keep this in, in mind as well. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, component one. 
Thanks very much for your attention on this. I hope you found it informative. We're going to come back after break. I'll let Mihai share the details with you. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can learn to effectively execute the plans for and share some stories of organizations that have done that. So thank you, Mihai. Thank you, Paul. Uh,